Okay, so so far in our video on extrinsic apoptosis, what we have seen is that the FAST ligand binding to the FAST receptor activates the FAST-associated deaf domain so that it can associate with another FAST-associated deaf domain on the FAD adapter protein. So the FAD adapter protein comes in and forms a complex with the FAST receptor. The FAD adapter protein then has another domain known as the DEF effector domain in orange here, which can then associate with a DEF effector domain on either procaspase 8 and 10. And this results in the large subunit and the small subunit cleaving off from this death inducing signaling complex, or DISC as the whole thing is called, and uh, then combining with other large and small subunits to create either active caspase 8 enzymes or active caspase 10 enzymes. And I should stress that large and small subunits of caspase 8 can only form a um, complex like this with other large and small subunits of caspase 8. They can't form it with large and small subunits of caspase 10. So you form caspase 8s and caspase 10s and you do not form chimeras of the two. Right, now, at the moment, you've produced these tiny number of these caspase enzymes, and these are a nice protease. I mean, the name stands for the cysteine-dependent aspartate-directed protease, as we saw in the videos on caspases. Um, but you've produced so few of them, these aren't capable of destroying the cell yet. So what happens is a positive feedback reaction. These are going to be what are known as initiator caspases. What they are going to do effectively is they're going to amplify the signal hugely. Because at the moment they are far too quiet basically to actually destroy the cell. So they need to engage in a positive feedback loop to create more and more caspases so that that larger population of caspases is then capable of breaking down the cell and committing uh, apoptosis or cell suicide. Okay, right, so these initiator caspases now need to activate other caspases. And I would compare this to uh, excitation contraction coupling in the heart, where you um, you let in a little bit of calcium from the extracellular fluid into the cytoplasm, but the calcium that you let in is far too small to actually cause contraction of the cardiomyocyte. So instead, what it does is it, um, is it, call, it activates the ranadine receptor 2 and causes calcium-induced calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And the massive amount of calcium that's released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum is then what causes contraction. So basically, this is like the calcium coming in from the extracellular fluid. It's too tiny to actually cause uh, destruction of the cell. Instead, it's going to then activate uh, the production of loads of more caspases, which are then going to be great enough to um, kill the cell. Okay, so let's look at the process by which you can activate caspases. So basically, you have in the cytoplasm loads and loads of procaspases. So these aren't just procaspase 8 and 10 anymore, they're procaspases of all the other types as well. In the cytoplasm, you have absolutely loads of procaspases. So these can be whatever type of caspase you like, all 12 types basically. It was the 8 and 10 which were important in going up to the, um, up to the uh, fast receptors and getting activated, but they've now been activated, and what they need to do is activate the rest of them basically. Okay, so let's say we have two um, procaspases here, and let me colour in the different portions of them. So let's colour in the prodomains up here in red, like so. Okay, so here are the prodomains, uh, and let's colour in in green the large subunits. So this is the large subunit of the caspases, or, or well, the procaspases at the moment. And uh, then finally in orange, we'll have the small subunit down here. Okay, right. So these at the moment are procaspases, so they are not active at the moment. But basically, in order to make them active, what you need to do is cleave at two sites. So you need to cleave along here, basically. This is the first cleavage site between the prodomain and the large subunit. And then you need to cleave 
between here and here, between the large subunit and the small subunit. And basically, what you create is, uh, firstly, the prodomains go off. They're not important. So here are the prodomains, which aren't important in this process. So here are the prodomains. So they're coming off, right? And I'll just color them in red. OK, so the prodomains are here. And uh, then what happens is these uh, two large subunits and two small subunits can then um, associate together to make an active caspase. OK, and I want to stress that this process can happen for... This is a general process for any caspase, basically. OK, so here's the active caspase. So the way in which you convert two procaspases into an active caspase is you chop at these two cleavage sites, OK? And basically what's going to happen is these caspase 8s and caspase 10s, which we have activated at the, um, at the, um, at the cell surface membrane by this um, disc, this death-inducing signaling complex, these are now going to go back into the cytoplasm and they're going to go to all of the other caspases in the cytoplasm and they're going to cleave at these cleavage sites and they're going to cut the, um, the large subunit away from the prodomain and cut the large and small subunit apart. And then what you're going to get is the formation of these active caspases. So basically what will happen is a massive positive feedback effect where just activating these tiny amounts of initial caspase 8 and caspase 10, which we're now referring to as the initiator caspases because they're the ones that are going to start it all off, they are going to lead to the activation of loads of other caspase enzymes, basically, via this process of converting the procaspases into active caspases. And then once you've created more active caspases, they will catalyze this process as well. So you're just going to get a massive, massive positive feedback loop where you just convert all of the procaspases in the, um, in the cytoplasm of all 12 types in the caspase family into active caspases, and they're all together going to destroy the cell. So these are now the executioner caspases. Okay, so I want to stress executioner caspases, that what was special about caspases 8 and 10 was that they had this death effector domain, which the others did not have, which is how they were activated by this fast signaling uh, complex up here, basically. And once they were activated, they then triggered the positive feedback loop where you create more and more caspases and then um, you have enough, basically, to start destroying the cell. And that, that will take you into the process of apoptosis. So these will now um, destroy the cells. They'll lead to apoptosis.